Amy Friend um, is, uh, I don't take no offense, but I think if you read um, Robert Kaiser's book, An Act of Congress, she and Jim Siegel are as much responsible for that uh, statute as are Messrs. Dodd and Frank. Um, Amy is uh, uh, senior deputy uh, controller of the currency and chief counsel. And uh, this is her second uh, session at the OCC, so you could say that she's OCC through and th through with a uh, brief stop off at the promontory group. But seriously, if you do get to read that book, you'll have great admiration for somebody who acted in Congress uh, in the good old days when people acted as though there was a tomorrow, when they had to deal with the same people the next day. Um, and sadly, those days are gone, hopefully just temporarily. So I'm not gonna occupy any more of her time other than to say welcome, Amy, welcome, Senator, and m welcome, Barney. It's good to have you here, and we, we appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Con. So it's really, it's my pleasure and privilege to be joined by Senator Chris Dodd and Congressman Barney Frank, former members of the U.S. House and Senate. And of course, they're well known to this audience for many reasons, but particularly as the architects of the sweeping financial reform bill that bears their name, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, or Dodd-Frank. So today we have Dodd-Frank on Dodd-Frank, which is a real treat, I think, for me in particular, having worked so closely with both Senator Dodd and Congressman Frank in enacting this legislation, which is truly historic. Uh, Chris Dodd is a former senator from the neighboring state of Connecticut, and he was the chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs all through the crisis, the, the uh, year leading up to the crisis, and then through the uh, passage of Dodd-Frank. And Barney Frank is a former congressman from this great state of Massachusetts, and the chairman, uh, former chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. So you know them well for Dodd-Frank, but also as chairman of the Banking Committees and House uh, Financial Services Committee, they were responsible for the TARP, um, for the Credit Card Act, which overhauled the credit card industry, the regulation um, of the credit card industry. Uh, they also worked on and passed the Housing and Economic Recovery Act, which created the Federal Housing Finance Agency, actually provided the authority to put Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship and the government backstop. But beyond that, they are also incredibly accomplished legislators for so many other reasons. Congressman Frank worked um, tirelessly on affordable housing, on budget issues, on equal treatment, anti-discrimination issues, and Senator Dodd uh, was the author of the Family and Medical Leave Act, um, also worked on a number of children's issues and uh, Latin America. So, so it's really exciting for us to have you here today. Um, and having worked with you on all of these uh, banking committee issues, I felt that I had a front row to history and got to see your formidable legislative skills in action. So we are uh, six years to the month when Bear Stearns collapsed. And uh, in September uh, 2008 was when the crisis really came on full, full force. And we are close to four years from the passage of Dodd-Frank. So I'm wondering if you can talk about whether the confidence in the US financial system that we saw evaporate really quickly during the crisis, whether it's been restored. Well, uh, briefly, first of all, thank you for inviting us to, uh, to come here today. And it's a pleasure to be with Amy and, and Jim and, our, and uh, the introduction's appropriate. I think Barton and I would both tell you that we were blessed to having remarkable people on our staffs that worked and uh, here, here. did a tremendous job in putting all this together. The names Dodd and Frank are on the bill, but the reality is an awful lot of people, including our colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, contributed significantly to the, to the legislation. But staff does deserve a great deal of attention, don't often get it. So Amy, thank you. Thank and, you, uh, And a pleasure <laughs> to be with all of you. I think it's coming back. I, I, I still think we have a long way to go. We're not there yet. Uh, it was shattered, obviously, by the events uh, beginning a lot earlier than 2008. Uh, with Bear Stearns going back. In fact, Jim Bunning, the Republican senator from Kentucky, uh, along with Jack Reed of Rhode Island, held hearings in 2005 and 6 on the residential mortgage crisis. Uh, so while people pay attention to what happened with Bear Stearns, what happened in September of 2008, the problems began a lot earlier. And the difficulty was getting people to pay attention uh, to the problems uh, that were emerging. 
the shattering of confidence. Uh, I'll just tell you one quick anecdote that relates, I think, to the subject matter. I recall having a conversation a number of years before, actually, these events with the manager of a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and I was curious as to why he parked as much of his nation's wealth in the United States. And I'll never forget his answers, because I think they're reflective in terms of where we sort of are. He said for two reasons. One, he said, no other country in the world is as good at making money as U.S. financial institutions are for, for people. But he said, my second reason for doing it is actually more important than the first. He said, I've never lost a moment's sleep worrying about whether or not the integrity of the financial services structure was sound and, and safe. I lost money, I made bad bets along the way, don't misunderstand me, he said, but I've never lost sleep over the confidence I've had in the structures, the financial architecture of the country. And that, that was shattered, and no question in my mind, it's coming back in my view, uh, but we're still not there yet. I think you, uh, in my mind, I agree with what Chris said, I'd make a distinction. I think there is more confidence in fact, as reflected by people's behavior, than there is in their opinion. That is, uh, as I look at the uh, financial structure, I don't see people sending their money elsewhere or putting in the mattress or any kind of you know, broad-scale disintermediation. But there is still this perception, and part of it, there are two reasons for this. The main one, I think, is uh, self-fulfilling prophecy on a particular issue, and that's on the question of uh, the too-big-to-fail banks. I am convinced, and Chris said, uh, it's one of the bipartisan things Chris worked on with Dick Shelby, although Shelby later disowned his child and berated it. But um, we did, I believe, the maximum that you could do legally to make clear that if a large financial institution incurs debts it cannot pay, it is out of business and no taxpayer money will be used. In fact, the most interesting critique I hear these days, and Tim Geithner repeats it in his book, which I just saw an early copy of, and uh, others, is that we were too tough on the anti-bailout, that we did not leave uh, uh, Sheila Bear's successors enough flexibility to, uh, to bail out the system in general. But what we've got is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have people who argue that somehow our system for putting these banks out of business won't work and they then point to the fact that they still enjoy, some people argue, a kind of a, an edge in financing, but to the extent that they do it, it's because the people keep denying that it's there. I've looked at the reasons they give why too big to fail won't work. One is the stupidest political argument I have ever heard, and I've heard a lot. It is that if a large financial institution got into trouble, despite a law that says it would be a felony for the Secretary of the Treasury to use public funds, there would be overwhelming public pressure on the administration in power to bail out that institution and keep it alive with public funds. I have only one question to people who say that. In what country? Anybody who lived through what we had in the United States, how they would argue that is just inexplicable. But I think, as I said, just to sum it up, people's behavior shows that confidence, I think, is, is coming back. Um, if you poll and ask them, they still say, uh, oh, we're worried, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the behavior is more important than the uh, attitude. Just, just to make the point on the, the Barney made on the, on the too big to fail, it was the very first amendment on the floor of the United States Senate as we began consideration of this legislation. And, and Dick Shelby offered the amendment, I was the co-sponsor of it, the Shelby Dodd Amendment, on too big to fail, it carried 92 to five uh, on the floor of the United States Senate as the first of 60 amendments in that debate over two weeks, two or three weeks. Uh, but clearly, uh, that, that bipartisan effort on that language uh, that is designed, as Barney said, today what we did in this fall of September of 2008 is against the law. <laughs> Not only is it against the law, I would defy anyone to stand up and offer on the floor of the Congress or the United States Senate a proposal to give $700 billion to financial institutions. And we specifically, <laughs> two things. First of all, the Secretary of the Treasury, it's now against the law for him to use public funds. He can advance some funds, he has to, he's mandated to recover them from large institutions. Secondly, the statutory authority that Ben Bernanke used, Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, no longer exists in remotely comparable form. So, it, 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 so the argument is that the Chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury would be pressed by overwhelming political pressure to violate the law to give more money to a large failing bank. No.
And do you think that Congress would support something right now? I think, A, they would impeach yeah. and convict of impeachment <laughs> any official who did that. Look, we had a hard enough time getting the tar pass. We had a Republican president. We had a Democratic Congress. That was before bipartisanship ended. And what ended bipartisanship was the election of Barack Obama and the Republican response. But we went to the Bushes. We, we worked hard on something that was essential. And it, I, I think it's very clear. History will record that the TARP program was the most highly successful, wildly unpopular thing the federal government ever did. And the notion that you could do it again is bizarre. So we have definitely had a conversation this morning about too big to fail, and there does remain some skepticism in this audience. One of the things that has been discussed is breaking up the big banks, restoring Glass-Steagall. There were um, amendments to that nature during Dodd-Frank, and now there are bills in Congress. And I'm wondering if you can talk about why didn't they gain traction then, and should we be discussing that right, now? I'll, I'll start with that. First of all, breaking up the banks is entirely a reasonable idea. I do have questions for those who ask it. A, to what size? I mean, if we are going to break the institution so no one institution is big enough to threaten us, then presumably they all have to be no bigger than Lehman Brothers was in September of 2008, because that failure was one of the precipitating causes. Secondly, how are we going to do it? Are we going to, and who's going to buy them? I mean, uh, I, I don't understand what the mechanism is. There is a, a, there's the Volcker rule and other things in there that do move them in that direction. Um, as to Glass-Steagall, as I look at the causes of this, uh, I think 100% securitization was a big part of the problem. Nothing in Glass-Steagall would have prevented Countrywide from making all those lousy loans and securitizing them 100%. Nothing in Glass-Steagall would have stopped AIG from screwing up as bad as it did with derivatives, because I don't think either Glass or Steagall ever heard of derivatives, unless they were very foresighted. So <laughs> I, I, I mean, if people want to break up the banks, and then I'm throwing one last thing. One argument. Now, they may be too big to manage. I, not, we, we didn't deal with that one way or the other. And as I said, there are things that, that, that shrink it. Um, and even on, on Glass-Steagall, I'm struck, but even Elizabeth Warren, who is a proponent of putting back Glass-Steagall, but she also acknowledges it was not, the, the, the repeal was not in any way the cause of the, uh, of the crisis. Well, I, and I agree with what, what Bonnie has just, uh, just said as well. I mean, I, uh, my view is that, one, the issue isn't so much the size of an institution, but rather the, the risk uh, that institutions take on. And, and to that extent, whether it's capital, uh, liquidity, other measures determine whether or not the, the institution is in good shape. Uh, merely making an assumption because of its size, it poses substantial risk, I, I don't think holds water, in my view. So uh, I'm, I'm inclined to want to, first of all, uh, first of all, first of all, the United States, there are banks in neighboring countries of ours that are much larger than U.S. banks, uh, per se. But I think we need to focus on the attention of, of risk rather than size. But secondly, if you're that interested in doing it, we provided the authority to break up institutions in the bill. In fact, under FSOC, of course, they have the power and authority to break up institutions. So it isn't as if the authority doesn't exist. We provided for it under certain circumstances. Obviously, it ought to be very rarely engaged, in my view. But nonetheless, the power does exist in the legislation that, uh, that we adopted. And I, I would repeat again, if there are people here who can tell me, um, how small is not too big? Yeah. Uh, what is the biggest we can let them go? As I said, I assume it's Lehman below Lehman. To what maximum size, if we were going to take that position, should we allow a financial institution to be? Yeah. So, and the, uh, and Glass Steagall, uh, my, uh, again, I, I agree with Barty on this. I, I, I voted and supported Graham Leach Bliley uh, back, as did about 90% of the Congress at the time. The issue in that bill had to deal with the, uh, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, was the huge debate during that bill. There was just general adoption of the notion that somehow we could create firewalls in the 21st century and we didn't need to have the kind of separation that Glass-Steagall called for. Uh, my own view is you don't want to go back to Glass-Steagall. As tempting as it may be, in my view, I think it's a mistake, in a sense. And we need to be looking at 21st century ideas and how we, how we deal with these matters, but I would not uh, believe it. And, and as Barney pointed out, even if you did today, what we went through uh, in 2007, 2006, 7, and 8, 
uh, Glass-Steagall wouldn't have done a darn thing. And the thing Volcker rule does, all, in addition to the individual thing, the Volcker rule moves you significantly in that direction. So let me uh, pick up on that. So Dodd-Frank deliberately pushes risky activities out of the banking system, like the Volcker rule. We've seen some mortgage servicing assets move out of the banking system because of higher capital, which is directionally aligned with Dodd-Frank and was compelled by, by Basel III. Um, does the act sufficiently address the buildup, the potential buildup of risks outside of the traditional banking system, such as through the FSOC and CFPB? And is it the right way to go in the long haul? Well, I, I believe so. Again, what you try with FSOC and, and, and the, and the uh, Consumer Protection Bureau, particularly with FSOC, is the idea that you, every time something emerges, a new product line emerges, or, or some new institution emerges that poses risk, you, you can't go back and pass legislation every year or two. And again, given the pace of changes that are occurring globally, and we're talking about a global marketplace today, one of the things that Barney and I care deeply about in, in all of this was someone was going to lead on these issues around the world. Uh, and if we didn't, someone else would. And to have to play by someone else's rules is not something I wanted to, to see happen. And so the United States, in my view, ought to lead in this matter. And we're getting some compatibility. We're looking not for duplication, but for compatibility or harmonization of rulemaking, if you could, in the European market particularly, as well as here. Uh, and so the idea of, of, uh, of, of pursuing uh, that approach made, made tremendous sense uh, uh, to me as we went, uh, went forward with it. So uh, again, my, my, my hope would be that what we've done is provide for the ability to look over the horizon where you can watch product lines, you can watch institutions, and if they're posing risks, you can respond to it uh, in a timely enough fashion. In fact, amazing to me, they took legislation to create it in a sense. It should have been occurring almost naturally where you have federal regulators meeting periodically with each other and talking about what was occurring, not only here but around the world, to respond in advance of things becoming what they did become, in this case here, the crisis of September of 2008. So that to me made an awful lot of sense. And consumer protection, uh, to me it was stunning in a way, the objections uh, about having a, a place where consumers of financial products could have some redress uh, of, of problems that were occurring to them. In this day and age, the fact that there was this hot, such hostile opposition <laughs> to the creation of a place uh, where consumers of financial products could not find some redress of their grievance was stunning to me in many ways. We did uh, actually deal specifically with two important risks. Um, you mentioned mortgages. We are pro-market. I found myself more pro-market than some of the people we were regulating. We affirmed my view uh, Senator Warren Magnuson, Chris served with, who was chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, at one point said in some frustration, all any business in America wants from government is a reasonable advantage over the competition. And uh, uh, when we talked, uh, I talked to two, ins two insurance company executives from two different companies, came to lobby me against our uh, requirements to make derivative trading more transparent to put it in markets. And one, the younger one blurted out, well, but Congressman, if you do that, and we have a deal, and we have to publish our price, somebody can come in and undersell us. And his older colleague said, no, we don't really, we, that's not our position, but it was. Um, we did only one thing did we ban, and that was giving residential mortgages to people who couldn't possibly pay them back. Uh -huh. So I believe the mortgage thing in general, that one we plugged. The other great risky area where we did it was substantive rules requiring derivative trading to be moved from almost all one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera, into a more marketplace situation. And one of the heroes of the implementation has been Gary Gensler, who was given too little money by the Republicans when they took over, but did a, uh, a, a very good job of it. So uh, uh, I think in, in those two areas, we did do some very substantive things. Uh, the last point is that we don't regulate institutions so much as activities. So even though the activities moved out of the bank, they are still regulated. There's capital and there is everything else. I mean, obviously you can't be sure of all this, but uh, uh, particularly in the area of, oh, the, but there is one last thing that I'm worried about. It's the one uh, part of the implementation that troubles me. I think that one of the most important things we did was to say there has to be risk retention when you securitize. Um, that was the transformative thing when the, the lender borrow discipline was, was, was done away with. Now, to get the bill through, one of the things that 
I would hate to hear was when Chris called me and said somebody else had decided that he or she was the 60th senator. Chris had this terrible job with that filibuster rule, and there were a lot of people who became the 60th senator. We had to, to get the bill through, weaken somewhat the requirement for risk retention. And we had to adopt a section that allowed super safe mortgages to be exempt from risk retention. And to my dismay, the regulators at one point, and it's still pending, were proposing, in effect, to have the exception eat up the rule and to have only two classes of mortgages, mortgages that were too bad to be made and mortgages that could then be made but without risk retention. Uh, Sheila Bear and I both wrote comments to, to object to that. That, that troubles me. If we can get some risk retention in there, I think we've built in a systemic protection. So you're right, that's very much a live debate amongst the regulators as we're in the middle of a pending rulemaking um, with some on the other side expressing concern that that may impact credit availability. Yeah, well, let me, uh, here's, and this is one of the things I want to talk about with the bill. Transitions are hard, although the transition I don't know how Chris feels because he took another real job. But the transition from having hundreds of thousands of people aggravate you to private life is a good transition. That was not hard. <laughs> but um, people, look, we used to have a lot of mortgages made in America before there was such a thing as securitization. And you have people who are convinced that if they have to do any risk retention, they won't give mortgages uh, to those people. I don't believe that. I, I know it's uncomfortable for them now. But I believe if we had a 5% risk retention on securitizers, that five years from now, there would be a demand for mortgages, there would be a supply of mortgage holders, and they'd get over it. That's my answer to the credit availability. I, I just have a comment, now that I've, I've, I've changed jobs, uh, that now that I'm head of the Motion Picture Association, I've been asked a lot about that transition. And uh, all I can point out is they left one group of bad actors for another group of bad actors. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, transitioning now. Um, during the formulation of Dodd-Frank, there was some discussion, particularly in the Senate, about regulatory consolidation. So, Senator, you had a proposal that would have taken the supervisory authority from the Fed and the FDIC and consolidated it along with the OCC into one federal supervisor, leaving the dual banking system, but that's at the federal level. And Congressman, I think that was something you decided not to pursue. Can you both talk about why you went there or you didn't and what were the impediments to it? Let me start with, okay. first of all, we did abolish the OTS, the Office of Fifth Supervision, which I had two alternative proposals. They were the regulator of AIG and my, I had an alternative proposal. One was to abolish them. Secondly, if we couldn't do that, change their name to the Office of Fig Leaf Dispensation. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we had the votes to do, to do the first. Um, so they had identical functions. The other, the next big thing, and it was, yes, Chris talked about putting, taking it out of the Fed, which I had talked about before. Now, Alan Greenspan had always argued that if you didn't have some regulatory authority in the Fed, you would not be able to have the input you needed for monetary policy. I looked at two former Fed presidents to see what they think, but at any rate, um, that was not the major problem. The major problem came, and the representative of uh, one, of the, uh, one of the objecting groups is here. The state chartered banks and the small banks came to us, and they said, we do not want to be regulated by the OCC because you will be throwing us in the same arena as the big national banks. And one of the things I should say, the big national banks had very little political clout. Nobody liked them. They had only representatives in a few cities. The political problems we had to deal with came from the credit unions, from the insurance agents, and from uh, retail banks. merchants, and the community banks. The community banks way outweighed the big banks. And the community banks said, we will oppose any bill that puts us into the same regulator. So that was the reason. That, I mean, th that's what stopped that. And we just could not have uh, overcome it. I think there was great logic to it. It was something I had thought about before. But um, there was just no way that you could pass a bill over the strong objection of the community banks and the state chartered banks. And they refused and were ready to lobby hard against being put in the OCC because they didn't want to be in with the big banks. Well, I, I, Amy points out in, in 2009, I think it was in November, I proposed a draft, what I called a discussion draft, of a bill uh, that did uh, 
basically consolidated and, and, and provided a single prudential regulator. Uh, and uh, it, 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 let me just quickly, the, Barney pointed out earlier, in the midst of all of this, obviously the political considerations. I know that's shocking to some, but you have to get enough votes to pass anything. And the reaction uh, to the single prudential regulator was overwhelming for a number of reasons. One is the other regulators certainly didn't want to be out of a job, <laughs> and so they were opposed to the idea. Uh, uh, you didn't have a lot of constituency interest in the subject matter of consolidation at all. Uh, and I say respectfully of our colleagues, we served, didn't know what you were talking about anyway, so that did, didn't have much of a constituency. And so the idea of consolidation, so we ended up, you're right, we got rid of OTS, but we added two. So instead of in consolidating, we actually grew <laughs> the regulator, regulator for us. If I had a magic wand, the one consolidation I think Chris would agree that we would have done was, I mean, in no rational world, if you were starting a country, would you have a Securities and Exchange Commission and a Commodities Futures Trading Commission sharing jurisdiction? Yeah. And uh, I, Tim Guyton, I just was reading Tim's draft, and he reminded me in that that he had asked me if it was possible to yeah. consolidate the two. And I said, oh, of course, just not in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you have deep <laughs> cultural issues. It's true. The CFTC belongs to the agriculture community, to the farmers. Yeah. The notion that they would be thrown in with the city slickers, it, it, it just never made sense. So, um, and that's in fact, other countries interest, have done it. Brazil, Brazil consolidated, in fact. They're, they're, uh, so other countries have actually Is that under a general, though? Or under a general, yeah. I think they got that done. So you, uh, uh, so that's what this it is takes. When a, when a hunter means something. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, uh, so that was, uh, and also then the supervisory function, and again, I say this respectfully, but, but uh, we tried to find where you could actually point to minutes uh, in, in Fed conversations where the supervisory function had ever been a part of consideration on monetary policy. I couldn't find a single example of it. So with all due respect uh, to the supervisory function, I could never find any place where it actually been exercised. So why the hell are you going to keep it in a place that doesn't use it, in a sense? So the idea of moving that off to get better supervisory activity seemed to be a natural enough inclination. Well, the bottom line of all of this, of course, I think I got three votes for the idea of all of these ideas at the time, and, and uh, we moved away. The old idea as well, at some point, someone needs to look at, at, at the Fed system, in a way. When you have, going back 100 years to Woodrow Wilson and the creation of the Federal Reserve System, uh, where regional banks, you have two in Missouri, I think, and uh, one in San Francisco, nothing in between, because there wasn't anything in between Missouri and San Francisco. So the whole idea of going back and, and re-examining that role. Uh, but again, there was no, no support for these things, which is an important point in all of this. And, and again, something Bonnie and I dealt with every single day. Uh, I mean, I've often been asked the question about the VOCA rule, and putting aside how you feel about it, I've been asked a million times since the summer of 2010, why did we end up with 3%? And, and I'd love to tell you that I gathered the smartest minds in the world to sit down and talk about proprietary trading. We had a long discussion. We listened to everybody. In the end, I had a bunch of people who were for zero and a bunch of people who were for 10. But I could get 60 votes for three. And I'd love to tell you it was more complicated than that. But basically, you have to keep in mind, if you don't get the 60th vote in the Senate, everything dies, in a sense. So these numbers are not magical. Uh, nonetheless, we tried to go through it in an intelligent enough way, but that's where you end up with these decisions that are based on the realities, that if you don't end up with the kind of support you need, so from time to time, Barney and I had to do things we were not overly enthusiastic about. There are parts of this bill I voted against <laughs> when we had amendments on the floor of the Senate. I know that's hard for people to understand today, but nonetheless, when you're trying to get that product done, you have to be mindful all the time that if you aren't able to keep together a majority in the House and a supermajority in the Senate, this is nothing we, more than, an, than a nice we, discussion to have. And that's the best it. example of that for me is the bill giving the Federal Reserve, it's the one price cap we put in there, the bill giving the Federal Reserve system, which it hates having, the authority to cap the amount that uh, credit card issuers can charge retailers. Um, I didn't like that. Uh, you voted against it, I thought, yeah. didn't you? And, but it was, it got 60 some odd votes in favor of it uh, in the Senate. I just, one little story. You mentioned the two Federal Reserves in Missouri. Uh, the president of one of them, I guess it's uh, the Kansas City, had been a fairly vigorous dissenter on much of Fed policy. And wistfully, one high-ranking federal official said to me at one time, when you're amending things, how about a law that says no state can have two Federal Reserve presidencies? <laughs> It's like senators. <laughs> when I ran, I ran for the Senate in 1980, Jim Buckley, who was a wonderful man, had been the senator from New York, and, and he decided to run in Connecticut, having served in the Senate from New York. And I used to remind Jim that the Constitution is rather clear on that point, 
that, that each state gets two senators, not each senator gets two states. <laughs> in the, in, uh, you, when, you're through, you know, when you're through here, would you go up to New Hampshire? I, know, I, gonna, I, I thought I might resonate with this audience here. That, uh, so I'm going to take you back a bit, but before I do, I just have to say on behalf of the OCC that we regulate over 1,500 community banks. So, yeah. um, and Cam Fine, by the way, and I must tell you, and Barney here? was terrific on this. And so yeah. is... Uh, no, they were terrific. I must say the, the community banks were tremendously constructive and helpful in, in putting this bill together. And it had not been for CAM and community banks working with us, this, this bill would not have, not have been, uh, not have never been been. passed. But their argument was if you're going to have a dual banking system, right. you have to have dual regulators mm -hmm. to reflect the state federal. Even at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to take you back in time to September 18th, 2008 which was the day that you both were called to Speaker Pelosi's office. Mm -hmm. And Chairman Bernanke and Secretary Paulson came in to tell you about what was happening to the financial system. I'm wondering if you can describe what happened in that room and what your reaction was. Well, I, 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 first of all, it's one of those days that become seared in your memory uh, that, that evening at around 7.30 when we about, I think, 14 or 15 of us gathered in that room, the leadership of both the House and the Senate and the respective chairs and ranking members of the committees of jurisdiction. And there was quite a conversation. But the, the, the moment that I remember most, most clearly was Ben Bernanke saying the following, which is not, I'm not speculating about what he said. I, I can tell you word for word what he said in the room that night. And as all of you know, Ben Bernanke is not the type to engage in hyperbole, doesn't raise his voice, rather low-key uh, individual in many, many ways. And he turned to all of us about some way midpoint in the meeting and said the following. Unless you act, speaking to the Speaker and the, uh, John Boehner, as well as to Harry Reid and, and Mitch McConnell and the rest of us, unless you act in a matter of days, the financial, the, the, the financial system of this country and a good part of the world will melt down. That's the Chairman of the Federal Reserve of the United States saying to the leadership of the Congress, Democrats and Republicans, about the significance of the moment and the importance to act. Uh, the oxygen left the room to a large extent. It may have only been a few seconds. It seemed like a minute or two before anyone regained their voice uh, based on what had just been said. And uh, left that room and, in fact, a sense of solidarity and, and, and working together. I was fortunate to have Judd Gregg of New Hampshire be my counterpart uh, on drafting of the TARP legislation. And uh, as a result, we were able to put together a bill. Uh, Hank Paulson sent me at 1.30 in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, a two-and-a-half-page bill, not a memo, but a bill, that said, give me $700 billion, no court or no regulator can intervene. Needless to say, when that became public information, the country erupted, uh, as you may recall, in those days. And so we were operating in that environment. Uh, we tried to come up with wrapping around ideas, such as bifurcating the boats and so forth, to create a greater sense of... of uh, of uh, security about what we were about to do. Uh, and went through it, uh, and then 40 days before the national election, we passed in the Senate 75 to 24. Ted Kennedy was the only missing vote that day. He was so ill, uh, could not make it down for the vote. Uh, I'll never forget that night, because I went around to Democrats and Republicans in the Senate who were up 40 days later. Uh, and I said to them, look, I've got the votes to carry this, and I realized this is the kind of a vote that will end your career uh, uh, here. And, and if you'd like to take a pass on this, I'm never going to repeat your name. I'll never tell anyone that you did so, but I understand if you felt you needed to. If I needed your vote, I'd tell you that, too. And, and I'll just tell you one quick anecdote and story. Gordon Smith, Republican senator from the state of Oregon. I went to Gordon, and I said, you're up in 40 days, and uh, the, the message being that if you need to take a pass on this, his colleague in Oregon was going to vote against the bill at the time. Uh, and I don't forget his answer to me. He said, that's a great offer, I appreciate it, but I've got to face a constituent tomorrow morning, and I'm not sure how to explain this vote. And I said, well, who's the constituent you have to see? He said, and I don't forget his answer, he said, the mirror, <laughs> the mirror. Uh, I happen to believe this is the right thing to do for the country. And he cast a vote for it. Forty days later, he lost his seat in the Senate, as did Bob Bennett from Utah and others. Uh, that, uh, not that year, Bob, uh, a, a year or two later. But the point is, that was a tough, tough vote. As, as Barney said, and I couldn't agree with him more, I'll go to my grave believing that we did the absolute right thing for the country at that moment. And had we not done so, we'd be looking at a very different place today, in my view. And I know historians will argue about it endlessly. Uh, it's proven to be not a financial disaster because actually we've recouped uh, the resources. But stabilizing the financial institutions at that moment was absolutely essential. A Democratic House and Senate with a Republican president 
we were able, 40 days away from a national election, to get beyond partisanship and do what was the right thing for the country. We, we were not... <laughs> We were not as successful in getting beyond partisanship in the House. The Republicans voted against their president. Um, you know, Lord Acton's dictum, uh, absolute power corrupts. I've always thought that needed an amendment. Uh, in some cases, it's impotence that corrupts. The Republicans in the minority felt free to vote against it and let us carry it. And the first time they voted against it overwhelmingly, the second time after the crash, they voted against it still, not by uh, as much. But as to that night, they had, Chris and I both had been hearing regularly from Paulson and Bernanke, in fact, all during 2008, uh, about every other weekend, after the markets closed on a Friday, I would get a call from gloomy Paulson, another institution failed, we got this problem, we got that problem. So we were kind of prepared for it. And they had credibility in particular because they weren't telling us this until Lehman was, went bankrupt. I think they tried to save Lehman. I believe they thought they had a deal with Barclays and the Financial Services Authority said no. I do believe they were honestly surprised by the depth of the reaction to Lehman. And we've all said, oh, well, this could have been as bad as the Great Depression. In some ways, as Chris said in describing, it could have been worse than this meltdown. During the Great Depression, you still had granularity in the world. There was something could be happening here. It wasn't affected by there. By 2008, we were on one financial grid, and, and the whole thing was, was, was uh, grinding to a halt. So they had all that credibility, uh, and yeah, it just didn't occur to us to say no. One other thing I would say, it has to do with legislative executive relations. If we had much more time to think about what to do, Chris and I might have come up with an alternative approach. Mm -hmm. But the initiative and a time like that is inevitably with the executive. And we had two choices, either say no or say yes with modifications. But there, there was no option of a, of a totally different approach to the problem. So in fact, you gave enough authority that they could change their approach, because you remember in TARP, they were going to purchase toxic assets, right. and you gave them the authority to provide these equity injections, and that's right. what they did. Right. Yep. So. Yes, and that's been paid back. We've actually, I think all of it has. And profited, and profited right. Yeah. So at some point you determined that legislation beyond the TARP was needed to reform the system. Do you think that providing the emergency relief to the system under the TARP created the urgency to pass reform legislation or did it undercut it? I don't think it was either, but I, we were aware of the need before that. I first became educated that we needed to do something more systemic with the Bear Stearns failure. Because what Paulson and Bernanke both said to us was, look, we weren't happy with having to do this with Bear Stearns, but we had no option. And Paulson began arguing all during that period until Lehman. He was, he and his other people gave a different opinion, but the lawyers at Treasury and at the Fed were convinced that in a case of a large financial institution faltering, they had two options. Either they could let it go bankrupt with no special rules, just plain flat out bankruptcy, paying none of the debts, et cetera, or intervening and propping it up. And what Paulson started arguing is, I need an alternative. I need a way that we can put it out of business, but not in the same sort of shocking way as bankruptcy. So we were thinking about that. Uh, we had also, as Chris noted, and this is one of the great uh, historical, I think, misunderstandings, we had both been working on the question of trying to curtail irresponsible subprime lending. <laughs> Um, and in fact, I know there was this uh, argument that it was the liberal Democrats who exacerbated things by trying to force uh, people who couldn't really afford them into loans. In fact, beginning in 1994 with a piece of legislation called the Homeowners Equity Protection Act, in a variety of ways, liberal Democrats were trying to slow down subprime loans. The free market guys, Alan Greenspan and others, were defending them. The day the committee I chaired was about to pass a bill to limit free uh, subprime loans, the Wall Street Journal attacked me by name and said, subprime loans are very good. That's the way minorities and poor people get housing. 80% of them are paying off on time. That seemed to me an odd statistic for them to cite with theirs. And uh, they said I was trying to create a Sarbanes-Oxley uh, for, uh, for subprime lending. So we were aware of pieces of it. 
But I think it was at that point that we decided we had to uh, get it all done. But I do, like, you know, take the opportunity to reiterate the more conservative free market people who are trying to blame us for this crisis never had any problem with subprime loans, both in theory or in practice, until the crash hit. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you, what, I, I became chairman of the banking committee. There's a, a, the Senate is not a meritocracy. You have to outlive and hope your friends get defeated in order for you to move, <laughs> up in the, move up in the food chain. And uh, so for, I sat on the Senate banking committee for 30 years, and, and when Paul Sarbanes decided to retire uh, in January of 07, I became the chairman of the, of the committee. I've mean, been on the committee for a long time, uh, and began a series of hearings. The first of them was in the first week of February of 2007 on the subprime lending. I, Hank Paulson came and testified, but he wanted to come and testify only about China. He didn't really want to talk about the subprime issue. So I said, fine, come talk about China. I knew my colleagues would not spend a lot of time on China, and, and obviously got into the subject matter of, of, the, uh, of the mortgage, growing problems with mortgages. We held 90 hearings in, uh, I did in, in 2007 uh, on the subject matter over the next 12 months. Uh, I remember the first, some of the first witnesses were people who were actually calculating what they thought this could result in in terms of foreclosures in the country. I remember the first witness talked about having a million foreclosures. It was highly ridiculed the next day or two as being engaging in hyperbolic uh, political talk when nothing like that could possibly happen. This, of course, we something we learned, four and a half to five million foreclosures occurred over the coming years. And, and despite all of that activity, it was just a refusal to acknowledge the growing problem uh, in the residential mortgage market. And then, of course, on St. Patrick's Day weekend of 2008, you have Bear Stearns. Many thought this was sort of a one-off problem. It really wasn't a systemic issue, a, a ludicrous proposition when you think back on it, obviously. So I get a, a terrible upset when people talk about, wasn't it, wasn't it wonderful that in September of 08, everyone sort of rallied and saved the country? Where were they? <laughs> there was a lot of information out there in 06, 07, about what was occurring. <laughs> and yet people unwilling uh, to acknowledge this and offer ideas. I believe, again, that had there been an intervention uh, earlier on, we would have had a crisis. Never the magnitude that we saw. Never the $12 trillion in lost wealth. Never the 26 million jobs that were lost. Never the four and a half to five million homes that were foreclosed. Not to mention what happened to some of the, some of the, the, the finest financial institutions in the country. Failing, consolidation that occurred in commercial banks, investment banks, thrifts, insurance companies and the like. It was a disaster. In my view, it didn't ever have to come to that had people been willing to acknowledge the growing problem that was clearly the evidence of. When you have brokers that were unregulated, being paid instantaneously for selling homes at adjustable rate mortgages when the banks knew damn well those ARMs never could that consumer afford that fully indexed price of that home. Never could afford it. And yet they were say, selling that mortgage in eight to ten weeks in a securitization market. There was no liability whatsoever. And so all of that was occurring and unwilling to step up in my view, but it could have been truncated earlier on had people been willing to acknowledge the magnitude of the problem that was, uh, was growing in front of us. Let me early on. Let me build on that, because I want to throw in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which is also being laid at our doorstep. The Republicans controlled Congress from 1995 through 2006, during which period nothing happened. No legislation passed. In 2006, Hank Paulson says this in his memoir, he told the president he wanted to try again. And a lot of his, the president's people said, no, it's too much trouble. He got the right to do it. He talked to us. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were reformed, and he was given the authority he wanted in the first two years of democratic uh, control. I mean, that's the, we, what happened was you had this general deregulatory view. And the other point I would make is in 2006, as Chris and I were about to become chairs after the 2006 election, I was asked to go to a Chamber of Commerce conference at which they were discussing the serious problem facing the American financial community, over-regulation. People go back and look at it. Um, they were complaining that there would never again be many initial public offerings in America because we were too stringent. Sarbanes-Oxley, et cetera. Um, Chuck Schumer and Mike Bloomberg commissioned a report from McKinsey saying we had to loosen it. Uh, Hal Scott at Harvard Law School had this. So, as we took office, there was a 
staunch defense on the part of people who said they were the market defenders of, of an unrestricted subprime regime and a claim that we had to cut down further on deregulation. So we really didn't even start from zero. We started below. So there clearly came a time that you agreed you had to move forward. Well, you, I mean, this has been, in, in fairness, like people like Hank Paulson and others, people have been talking about, about reforming the, the financial architecture of the country for a long time. But again, it's a classic case that Congress never acts unless there's some sort of a crisis around it. I mean, just sitting back and recognizing that probably need to sit back and, and do something about this in the absence of some crisis, it's just awfully difficult to do. I mean, you could never today, you couldn't pass Dodd-Frank today. You couldn't have passed it in 06 or 07 or 08. The one time you could do it is when we did it. Uh, and had we not acted in that window, in my view, to, to come through TARP uh, and what was out there and to walk away as if you had somehow dealt with the issues uh, in front of us would have been a travesty in my view. So the effort, you had to make an effort uh, that others had talked about for a long, long time. And how do you reform this in a way that makes some sense, uh, that uh, stabilizes, strengthens the financial institutions, provide the kind of protections, transparency needed, to have some ability to look ahead, not try to, to sort of uh, to uh, micromanage every detail, but to provide institutional framework in which future institutions can respond to emerging uh, product lines or institutions that people can't even imagine today might exist. And so my, my feeling was that had we not moved when we did, uh, we were just functioning as if the world still existed as it did in, in the fall of 2008, we'd be in a mess again. Yeah, part of it is the dynamic of politics and, uh, and the voters who sometimes a part of the problem. Um, the TARP, as I said, was very successful and very unpopular. But the success didn't factor into people's opinion. Here's the problem. In doing the TARP, we did something unpopular that staved off disaster. Here's the disadvantage politicians are at vis-a-vis -vis economists. Economists can write articles and do analyses in which they invoke the counterfactual. They can talk about why this was a good thing because they can talk about the counterfactual, what would have happened. Politicians are not allowed to use the counterfactual. Any elected official gets up there and says, look, I understand you're upset, but it would have, I saved it from getting a lot worse. I will, I mean, it was so frustrating. I, actually had a slogan which Jim Siegel's brother uh, uh, printed up, which I was dissuaded from using in 2010. <laughs> it said, things would have sucked worse without me. <laughs> that, was, that was my political thing, but the problem was <laughs> we got all of the negative political vibes from the TARP mm -hmm. and very little uh, public. That's why it was still very tough to get the bill through. So. You mentioned, obviously, the crisis was providing the impetus for getting something done. Right. To what extent was it the crisis and a Congress and an administration of the same party that allowed you to do it? Or how much was it the personalities and your relationships and your relationships with others that allowed you to move forward? Well, all of those factors contribute to, uh, to it to some degree. And, and I mentioned something at the outset of, of your questions, Amy. And, um, and Barney and I think feel very strongly about this. Uh, you know, again, our names are there, and we teasingly, I remember it was about four o'clock in the morning when, when a congressman from Pennsylvania made the motion to call this bill at the completion of the conference, to call it the Frank Dodd bill. And, and, and Barney said, no, they'll think it's one person, you can't do that. Uh, and and, uh, <laughs> and I, I, said, I said, no, I know what you're thinking, Barney, no one remembers Hawley's name and Smoot Hawley, so you want to reverse <laughs> those names and going back. But, but the fact is, it, and, and I think it's true in the House as well, but Bonnie can speak to that, but in the Senate, I, this bill never could have been done had it not been an awful lot in this bill, my Republican colleagues. One of the things I did early on, as Amy knows, and, and Jimmy knows, and, and, and Bonnie knows, uh, I didn't tell my, even my staff I was going to do this. I invited the Republican and Democratic members to meet in the Foreign Relations Committee room on the first floor of the Capitol, if all of you down in that room, the old historic room where they meet after a vote one night, about seven o'clock at night, and I announced, be, before I ever telling anyone, pairings, where I took a Democrat and Republican in the committee and assigned them the responsibility to be in charge of drafting and dealing with various subject matters. So I asked Mark Warner and Bob Corker to deal with Too Big to Fail. I asked Jack Reed and Judd Gregg to deal with the derivative section. 
I asked Chuck Schumer and Mike Crapo to deal with corporate governance issues. Every Democrat and every Republican on the committee was asked to work together on that particular issue. It was more than, there was just too large a questions for the committee as such to deal with it. So an awful lot of this bill, <laughs> while their names are not on it, <laughs> and while they don't necessarily have voted for it, there are major factors that contributed to what's in this bill. So in a sense, it was disturbing to watch people with provisions that they wrote or in the bill walk away from the product in the end, uh, in a sense. So that was terribly disappointing to me, because candidly, had there been more participation on some of these issues, the bill would look a little different today than what it does. Uh, I think we wrote a good bill. I regret we didn't end up with a strong provision on ratings. Uh, on, I would have loved to have had us deal, once again, with Fannie and Freddie, with housing finance, if we could have. Bankruptcy law needs to be addressed at some point. A lot more could have been dealt with, in a sense. And I'm grateful to people like Bob Corker, who they did contribute, and Mark Warner, and Judd Gregg, and others who contributed to the bill. Just disappointed in the end that when I asked for their support in the legislation, that they couldn't do so because of two issues. <laughs> and this is what the stunner comes in. There were two issues that basically drove people away. The creation of a Consumer Protection Bureau and on say on pay, corporate governance issues, those two. It wasn't the VOCA rule. It wasn't what we did in the derivative section and so forth. It had to do with the creation of a Consumer Protection Bureau and, the cre and, and what they perceived as being too tough on corporate governance issues. Those were the two factors that caused this bill not to have more bipartisan support. Yeah, let me, to respond, I directly to your question, I think that sets the stage for me. If you said, was it necessary to have a Democratic president, House, and Senate? No, but it would have been a different bill. Um, I, it would have been possible if we had a Republican president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. It would sadly not have been possible if we had a Democratic president and a Republican House and Senate. I'm being very explicit. We showed much more willingness to cooperate with a Republican president than they ever showed either Bill Clinton and certainly uh, Barack Obama. Now, we would have had to weaken a little bit. And my, one example of that is, you mentioned uh, HERA, the housing bill. That was a major piece of legislation. It reorganized Fannie and Freddie and gave the Secretary of the Treasury power to do it. It uh, created the first efforts to try and deal with foreclosure. It dealt with a very large chunk of things, giving large authority to the Secretary of the Treasury. That happened with the Bush administration and the Democratic House and Senate. So yes, it could have been passed if it was a Republican House and Senate, but it would have been a, a, a less liberal bill. Uh, and they sort of did us a favor. Now the other thing is in the House, the Republicans just signed off. Um, and, but here's the other important point I want to make about public opinion. We sent the bill over to the Senate. And the norm on things like that has been with a Democratic majority in the House when we only need an absolute majority, and Chris needed 60, we could be a little tougher. And then he's got to make some compromises to get to the 60. Um, in fact, part of the problem was the public wasn't paying much attention when we were dealing with it. Healthcare was dominating the media. So I actually lost a couple of votes on the floor on derivatives. The bill that went out of the House was weaker in the derivative section than I wanted. It's a moderate Democrats and Republicans who vote no. And the assumption was that, well, when it got to the Senate, they could weaken it. Uh, Bob Kaiser talks in his book about expectations of that. And Chris went to work. And then what I think was transformative was the passage of the health care bill in April. Because when the health care bill passed, then we became the center of attention. And at that point, public opinion, which had been sort of sitting out our fight, came in to some extent on our side, and I think that was very helpful. Let me mention something that I've mentioned in other settings, and, and, and uh, I was incredibly fortunate to have Barney Frank in the House, and I'm about to get him in some trouble with his former colleagues. Uh, House members have a healthy disregard for the Senate, uh, and for obvious reasons, over the years. But you need to have a House chair that understands the role of the Senate and how it functions. And had we not had Barney as the chair of the House Committee, uh, then dealing with the Senate might have been so much more difficult. Uh, I, I couldn't have had a better ally uh, when we're trying to work out the compromises in the conference than to have Barney, who understood and appreciated how difficult dealing with the Senate was in the 60 votes to get done. So uh, I'm not saying it merely because I've, Barney, I've mentioned this in other forums around the country, but in your own home state here, I want people to realize that you played an incredibly important role because you understood that dynamic which unfortunately is not well understood by an awful lot. Well, I understand, and yeah. you said that senators, representatives don't like the Senate. Um, 
understanding is not necessarily liking, but uh, you live with what you get. <laughs> not Chris personally. <laughs> but look, it's, it's happened. I mean, uh, you know, what it really meant was you could, could you count the difference between 59 and 60. Yeah. And that's, that's where we got to 3% on the Volcker rule. That's where we got to an exception um, uh, on the uh, question of uh, uh, risk retention. And where we got the one thing where I think the bill went further than it should originally, we rolled it down some, and that was the Lincoln Amendment, which said that, uh, you know, that, that uh, the banks couldn't do any kind of derivatives, even if it was for themselves. And you know, there was almost implicit in your question, if you've got an activity that is necessary, why is it a good idea to move it from the more regulated to the less regulated form? Um, but those were, all, those were all things that happened because we needed a, you know, a, and the other thing too about the Senate, makes Chris crazy, is the Senate's a very democratic place. Everybody gets a chance to be number 60. Um, enabled by the fact that we had a couple of Democrats who, who, who voted no, like Wes Feingold, who said it wasn't perfect, so therefore he wasn't gonna vote for it. Um, but, but yeah, every, every other day, some senator decided to be number 60 and we had to do something. And it kept changing. The numbers of Democrats in the Senate changed during that well, time and, as and well. Senator Kennedy died. And, uh, and Senator Byrd. Uh, Byrd, and uh, just it was constantly a moving target. And, and let me, you know, mention something else as well to this audience, since many of you in the room obviously are involved in the business today. Uh, uh, Barney and I have left the Congress, uh, but as I look over my, uh, and I have great reverence for the institution I served in, and it's going through a terrible uh, time right now, which we've all talked about, but also something different uh, from those of you who come from the perspective of the financial services sector. The days when you had people like a John Chafee and a Jack Danforth and a Howard Baker and so forth, Bob Dole, are gone. <laughs> the new crowd, believe me, uh, in a sense, look at these issues in a very different way. Uh, you have a, what I would call sort of a, 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 it's a populism in a way that is worrisome to me in terms of how they look at the financial services sector. Uh, one of the classic examples we had in a sense that Barney went through when you had Rand Paul, who offered the language on the Federal Reserve uh, to require an audit of the Federal Reserve, in effect. Of the Open Market yeah. Committee's open votes market on interest committee. rates, not on, not on the financial transactions, yeah. but on the voting process by which the Open Market Committee set the rates. There was, there was a proposal to offer the exact same amendment on the floor of the Senate. Had that amendment been adopted, I don't think Barney and I could have gone forward with the bill. Uh, in good conscience, I couldn't uh, do, do away with the independence of the Federal Reserve. Whatever other concerns I had about the system, destroying the independence of the Federal Reserve could have easily brought the whole bill down. And as a result, uh, but they came very close. The amendment was about to be offered by Bernie Sanders of Vermont, joined with uh, the most conservative member of the Senate. We're joining together on that proposal. To his credit, Bernie Sanders, I went and talked to at great length, and he decided to modify and change that substantially. And as a result, the amendment was not offered. And as a result, we were able to drop the House provision in conference. Had that exact language been adopted, you cannot get rid of language that's adopted equally in both bills. And that would have brought the whole bill down. But that's an indication for you out there of what we're looking at today in terms of how Congress, the members of Congress, look at the financial services sector. So when people start talking about repealing all of this and doing away with it and going back to the fall of 08, as if somehow you can create out of this system a reflection of what used to be in terms of members, how they looked at the institutions, I would caution you to be careful of what you wish for. And I, again, sound somewhat partisan, but there was this problem with the increasing conservatism of the Republican Party. You just saw conservative Republicans sabotage the effort to improve the IMF. The Ukraine bill passed only after, now every other country in the world has agreed to rearrange the voting structure of the IMF in ways that would do us no damage. But the IMF, in fact, when I was still there, the Republicans tried to get an amendment through, it was after Chris left, it actually passed in the Senate, to uh, tell the IMF that we would withdraw if they participated in the rescue of Europe, that they had to stay out of uh, dealing with the European crisis. And you also have this attack on the Fed. It's got some left-wing objection and some very conservative objection. And I would hope the business community would work with some of their Republican allies that they support, tell them to please stop trying to destroy the IMF and the, uh, and the Federal Reserve. And I have to tell you, I thought it was kind of a pain in the ass to be defending um, the Federal Reserve <laughs> against, uh, I, I would have business people call me up and tell me you gotta protect the Federal Reserve, and then they'd go out and give money to the people who were trying to destroy it. So that wasn't nice. 
So <laughs> we have time for one question. So no pressure on that one questioner, but if somebody wants to get up and ask the one. Really not one brave soul wants to get up and ask a question. It's not as much fun to pick on former members of Congress. <laughs> Over there, Amy. Okay. The, we'll repeat you it. go to the microphone. We can repeat the question. Or the parts of it we like. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you don't hear it, you can ignore yeah. it. So uh, I think everybody here respects uh, your efforts in trying to make the financial sector much safer. And uh, uh, we all, I think, feel you're, uh, we're fabulous representatives of the country. But there's a lot of people who think uh, that the financial system might actually be at greater risk today than it was before the legislation was passed because not just of the concentration of the big banks, and still the ongoing size of the um, shadow banking sector and their significant leverage, but because the government ha is less able to bail out, uh, has less flex flexibility. Now you say we have uh, under Dodd-Frank much better kind of foresight. We have these committees are gonna meet to look at all these indicators, but we do know that I think Bear Stearns was selling at a pretty good price about a week before it collapsed. Uh, Lehman had triple A rated bonds a couple months before it collapsed. Uh, the ability to really foresee a panic and a run on the bank uh, is, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So uh, have you in some ways added, I know you've made things safer, but have you also made things riskier in some ways? And have you done enough for, to make the thing more, uh, less opaque, the system, and have less leverage? My questions. And I, the suggestion that we, as a result of the bill, the system is less safe is nonsensical. Okay. Um, you do make two criticisms, which I've heard, but rarely from the same person. <laughs> <laughs> one, is, one is that the institutions, uh, there's too much bank concentration, um, which often, more often comes from the left. And then the other is, uh, we haven't left enough bailout authority. Um, as to the first, the bill did nothing to advance concentration. I, I, what I, I, happened, as some of the bankers have pointed out, one, of, one fact that led to increased concentration was something we have resolved. Bank of America got bigger when it took over Merrill Lynch at the federal government's request. J.P. Morgan Chase got bigger when it took over Bear Stearns at the federal government's request. We have provided a mechanism so there will no longer have to be the Federal Reserve and the Treasury telling the biggest banks to become bigger by taking on some, some weakened uh, activity. As to their leverage, and Amy pointed this out, that really is more Basel III than us, but the leverage is substantially reduced by much higher capital standards. As to the no bailout authority, there is an ability in the Federal Reserve to set up a facility that can lend to institutions not just a one-off to one institution, but can set criteria so that it can advance funds to institutions which are solvent but illiquid. Um, beyond that, uh, the notion that we would have a situation where the taxpayers would be paying off the debts of these large financial institutions with no penalty to them, uh, no, that's, that's just not politically possible. Let me just say, to, to, it goes a bit beyond your question, and, and something we, we haven't talked about here. And Barney and I didn't write something that's biblical. I mean, we did our best under the circumstances. And, and I've never seen a piece of legislation that was more than a page or two long that didn't have, didn't maybe overstate something, didn't understate something. Time will require us to go back and review uh, in time. And obviously, the regulatory process, the implementation, is taking an awful long time uh, to go forward. And I know there are costs associated, but I mentioned some of the costs that really get discussed when you talk about what happened as a result of the environment that causes much damage to the country and to the world. But, but my hope is that people go forward, you'll get intelligent people stepping up and offering intelligent ideas on how to make this work better. Uh, and that's what this process of, uh, of the reviews and so forth that, that require. And you're not going to shock me to find out that some changes need to be made in this legislation because of unintended consequences. Neither one of us have a problem with that. <laughs> uh, but you don't not pass legislation 
because you're fearful that maybe some change is required down the road in, in what, you're, what you're trying to achieve. So clearly the job of people like the OCC and the SEC and other organizations, which are doing an incredible job under the circumstances in my view, given the pressures they're under here to come out and make sure that what we're doing here. Remember, Barney and I tried to frame this to some degree. The banking legislation in the 1930s, on average, were 25 pages long. They gave all the power to the regulators yeah. and never said anything at all about the definitions. We tried to provide some parameters here in moving forward, leaving a lot of flexibility for those who know a lot more about this and have the benefit of a lot more comment to make sure they're making the right decisions in a regulatory framework. I'm confident that can happen still. Slowly, unfortunately, but it will happen in my view. One last sentence. One last, point, okay. One last sentence. Fine. Yes, as Chris said, people who are in the business, people who have experience, can play a very constructive part in improving it, but not as long as they are still wishing that it would drop dead. Yeah. <laughs> the price of participation in improving something is a willingness to accept its reality and, and work with it. And that's been one of the problems that we've encountered so far. So please join me in thanking Senator Thank Johnny Congressman. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, great job. Thank you. Thank you.